anything to do with oh, slide that. Yeah, whatever the contract. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Todd. It's Andy. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Yoshi Shimizu. I'm a, a longtime uh, volunteer with FRC. Do a lot of uh, work as master of ceremonies at different regional events. I'm also uh, part of the first in the Upper Midwest Board of Directors, and uh, also a, a mentor with Team 1816. And uh, what I wanted to do today, and I'm also going to be assisted by Sandy Olson, who's uh, with Team 2502. I'm going to tell you about a little uh, kind of exercise, I guess, or activity that we'd like to uh, pilot, I guess, in front of you and see if that's something that your teams might be interested in doing. So um, really, this afternoon, I really want to talk a little bit about um, the growing importance, I think, and recognition by FIRST uh, about the importance of representation and equity, diversity, and inclusion within the FRC program, as well as in FLL and FTC. And uh, let's start with sort of some definitions in terms of what we mean by um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we'll start with diversity, which really what we're talking about when we're talking about diversity is we're really talking about who is in the room and what does the people in the room kind of look like. Equity and inclusion really focus on what that room is like sort of what's the environment within that room for the people who are in the room? Like, is there a culture of belonging that actively invites the contribution and participation of all people? We've been talking a lot about that today, actually, which is great, sort of this issue about culture, kind of the community that you create within your team. And equity is a component of that, sort of like what opportunities are given to people in the room? And is there, in fact, fair treatment? equality of opportunity, fairness and access to information and resources for everyone that's in the room. And so those are kind of the operational terms that we kind of think about when we're talking about um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So let's start with this question about diversity and kind of who's in the room. And in this case, when we're talking about the room, let's talk about uh, the FRC community in Minnesota, right? The students and the mentors. What does that actually look like? So I was going to do something interactive, but I can't really do it with the laptop, so I'm going to use it with, with uh, here with this uh, larger console. But what's your estimate about the percentage of FRC students in Minnesota who competed in 2020 who identify as women? What do you think that percentage is? 25. 10. Any others? 25, 10? 26. 26. <laughs> <laughs> it's not price is right. <laughs> Any others? Eight? That's 28%. So right around 27, 28%. In terms, and this is based on you know registrations for that are happening in um, in FRC. So you can clearly tell there's underrepresentation of girls and women in FRC. What about mentors? What do you think the percentage is? Mentors? Yeah. Mentors who identify as women. Six percent. <laughs> five percent. Six, five, five <laughs> twenty. It's actually right about the same, 27 <laughs> percent. Right? So um, so clearly when it comes to gender, there's underrepresentation. And we know this is true in STEM in general, right? That's uh, it's 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 um, women are, are in many cases vastly underrepresented. When we think about um, race and ethnicity, you know, we all know that the population in Minnesota is really diversifying very rapidly. And it's happening at the younger age levels, right? So the students in FRC, it's a completely different community that they're interacting with and working with than for those of us who are 50, 60, 40, whatever years old, right? It's a huge demographic shift that's happening. Uh, in our state. And when you look at um, the FRC universe in Minnesota, right, Asian representation is reasonably close to the 11th grade population in Minnesota. But when we look at Hispanics and we look at African Americans and Native Americans, those are underrepresented in the FRC community when compared to the 11th grade population in the state of Minnesota. 
And unfortunately, when we look at the demographics for mentors, it's actually worse. So there is dramatic underrepresentation of Asians, Hispanics, African Americans, Native Americans in the mentor population of the state. So again, this question about do our students see individuals who look like they do in these very important roles like mentors? If you are from certain demographic groups, the answer unfortunately is probably not, probably no. So that's kind of where what our universe within FRC looks like in terms of diversity. Now, over the past year, I would say first has really been prioritizing initiatives, resources for students who are underrepresented, underserved, and vulnerable. This is their definition essentially of diversity. So you can see it's both not only racial and ethnic diversity, it's gender, economic status. Um, LGBTQ youth, um, education status, those living in rural, uh, rural and urban areas, and so on and so forth, right? So um, when you think about diversity or when you're thinking about resources that might be available to you as a team that are coming from sponsors, coming from FIRST itself, this is kind of what they're, what they're referring to when they're referring to diversity. So there are a couple, I think, of key questions that um, that we think about, I think, in terms of the importance of this with regard to FRC. So one key question is, you know, everything is kind of local. Even the data that I show you in the state, there are some dramatic differences when you drill down into the local level. So for example, there's a part of the state of Minnesota where there's essentially equivalent participation of girls and boys in FRC in 2020. And that was Roseau County. So um, you can tell that it's quite, it can be quite different at the local level. So the key question is really kind of, do the students on your team, do the mentors on your team reflect the diversity in the school or community that they represent? So when you look at your team, does it look like your high school? Does it look like your, your school? Are there certain segments of the student population that are not in the room? And is that important? That's the other big question, if that's not true. So that's the second question, right? Is your team, can your team be able to more effectively meet its mission if it's more diverse and representative? So that's what I want to spend a few minutes on talking to you about this, which is I hope to convince you that this is true. And this is a short video about um, a book that's called The Diversity Bonus, I believe, from Scott Page, which talks about this important topic. Let's see, how can I get this to work?
that's kind of the business reason I think that why there's so much interest in this in this topic. If you think about that table, that's kind of sketched out. Think about your think about your kickoff meetings and your brainstorming sessions, right? How many ideas are being thrown out about how you're going to build that robot? How many of that, those ideas are going to be similar because the background of the students in the room are similar? And would there be value in having a student from a slightly different background who is contributing ideas to that build process? That's the idea. That's really the essential idea. And when you bring those individuals together that come from those different backgrounds, there's a subset of ideas coming from one person and a different subset of ideas coming from another person. You combine them together in the same room. Could you end up with a one plus one equals three situation? Which is even better. Okay. That's really the, that's really the component. So what's missing? What's missing from your team that could provide this value and could make your robot better? Maybe make your competition season better, maybe make your outreach better, maybe make everything that you're kind of focusing on make your culture better because of that. That's really that's really kind of a question. So why this is why I think it's important in FRC. And there are a number of reasons why you might think this is important or you might be motivated to pursue it. So one is obviously it might be personally important to you, right? From either your perspective of your team, you want your team to be better, or maybe it's just for you, it's just the right thing to do, right? That's important. The other is it may be important to your team. Your students are in a, I will tell you that I think our students on our team are in a completely different place than our adult entry zone with regard to this question and this topic. And it's really important to most of them. So you may not know that, but it's probably important to your team. It's clearly important to first right now. Um, and the other important thing is it's becoming more important, important for sponsors. We'll talk about that in a minute as so. well. Okay, so let's talk about the importance to first, and we'll talk about the importance to sponsors. The so one is, um, I think the most, one of the most um, obvious ways that first has been emphasizing the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion is in the new Chairman's Award Executive Summary question. So there is a new question this past year, describe your team's efforts in the past three years to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion within your team, first in your communities. That was brand new past year. And I had the opportunity to kind of judge some teams this year. And I can tell you there were a wide variety of responses to this question. And I think it was sort of like this year or this past year, it was sort of like, we're gonna give teams this opportunity to think about this question. But next year and the years after, I think it's probably going to be more than just think about it. What are you actually actively doing in the year? Also last summer, I don't know if you are aware of this Instagram account called Dear First Robotics, which was published, began, I think, back in June. And I think was active until about September. But if you read those posts, they were basically posts from first robotics participants about instances of bias, and microaggressions and discrimination and harassment that students have encountered in their experience. So it's kind of eye-opening to me. I think we all think that our students are having great experience, but they're not all having a great experience, you know, in, in the workshop or in their teams. There's a culture that's not very supportive. There were uh, accounts of instances of bias at events and competitions. But that experience was not very positive. Um, so, you know, I think we'd like to think that our, our community is welcoming and inclusive and equitable for all, but it's not true for every single student that participates. Now, let's talk about sponsors. So, um, sponsors are interested in this question because it directly impacts the quality of the products that they make, right? And we have numerous examples where lack of representation in the room as products are being designed and developed have a really negative impact on the outcome of that product development. One of the oldest ones is about seatbelts. You know, seatbelts were designed by men back in the 50s. Crash test dummies were all based on men. And even to this day, seatbelts are not as safe for women as they are for men. 
because of that bias that existed when those seatbelts were initially designed. We have lots of examples in the computer industry about problems with artificial intelligence and vision, for example. So Google's computer vision system labels African-Americans as gorillas, while Microsoft's vision system was reported to fail to recognize darker skinned people. Speech recognition systems identify words spoken by white users at a much higher rate than words spoken by black users. And in medicine, algorithms used by US hospitals found to be less likely to refer black people than white people who are equally sick to programs that aim to improve care for patients. And in medicine, you know, racial and ethnic minorities and women are subject to a whole list of unequal kind of treatments, less accurate diagnoses, curtailed treatment options, less pain management, ultimately leading to kind of worse clinical outcomes. Much of this is because there aren't enough African-American doctors there aren't enough African American engineers who are in the room when these products are being designed. So that's what sponsors are thinking about. That's what these companies are thinking about. They know the workforce is rapidly diversifying, particularly the young workforce. They know they need to tap into that. They know it's a benefit to companies to do that. That's why they're particularly interested in programs like FIRST, which provide a pipeline for a future workforce. Right? So this is the other question, right? that you want these sponsors are really interested in providing opportunities for a really diverse young workforce. How do they actually go about doing that when they haven't had a history of really doing that in the past? So if you look at some of the grant opportunities that exist out there right now for FRC teams, there are new expectations from sponsors about your team having some commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion if they want to sponsor you. This is one from Abbott. And you'll see here that, say, 2021-2022 season in the US located in an Abbott facility state and who serve underserved, underrepresented, and vulnerable students that first has prioritized. Right. So already they've kind of narrowed or looking specifically for teams that are focusing on that kind of uh, support for those students. I'm aware that 3M this year, their sponsorship is really focused on supporting teams that are doing outreach to underrepresented populations. Medtronic, also the same thing. They are going to be changing, I think, some of their sponsorships in the, in the next year for teams focusing on this specific issue. They're going to ask you basically as a team not to change the world, but to just begin the effort to begin this discussion and to begin trying to uh, focus on this. Right. So just as a heads up there in terms of what's happening. So how do you actually go about doing this? Like when we talk about culture, how can you embed equity, diversity, and inclusion as a key foundation? Right. So one is, I think, first again, like Lori mentioned, has a lot of great resources online. But one of those great resources been around for a while is the equity, diversity, and inclusion training for both mentors as well as for students. Minimally, I would encourage your, your teams to kind of complete that training. In many cases, I think some of these grants are going to ask you to do that as a condition of applying for the grant. So just be aware of that, that resource is out there. Um, be very intentional about kind of your team culture and your activities, right? How do you go about recruiting, retaining students and mentors? What, what's the process you use to select students for leadership positions, or captains, or the drive team, chairman's presenting? What's your overall team climate like and the overall sense of belonging that you create within your team? Model expected behavior, call out poor behavior, and on your team. And I can tell you that, you know, I do a lot of this work at the university and these are really, can be really uncomfortable conversations, really difficult ones, but they need to happen. And I think actually your students are probably ready to have these discussions. I'm sure they have it in school um, and they're ready for this, I think. And again, for the other kind of key message here is don't take your students, don't underestimate what your students are capable of doing. And I think they are capable of kind of working on this issue and talking about it. So Sandy and I want to kind of present to you 
one way in which you might begin to think about doing this. And this is stolen completely from colleagues of mine at the university. So this is from the University of Minnesota Science, College of Science and Engineering Diversity and Inclusivity Alliance. And it's something that I'm gonna call here an FRC EDI moment. And the way the College of Science and Engineering came about this is they apparently have what are called safety moments in their meetings where, and you can, you can relate to this as well. There's a huge safety component to FRC, but apparently at some of their meetings, for example, this is where the chemistry department is located at the U. And there's a lot of safety considerations with chemistry. They're doing all these wild reactions in these hoods. And if you hear about fires in buildings, they mostly come from chemistry experiments that don't work well. So they have these moments where it's just a couple of minutes at the start of a minute, where it's a start of a meeting, where they talk about some aspect of safety. Right? So the idea here is actually to spend a couple of minutes at a meeting to talk about some aspect of their equity, diversity, and inclusion. The way this is working at this CSE is it's a one to two minute short presentation, an activity, a teaching or intervention at the beginning of a professional or social event centered on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And the idea here is to really normalize these conversations to help promote a culture, again, of acceptance, supporting belonging, respect, and awareness, cultivating a receptive environment for difficult conversations and to provide an opportunity to kind of reflect and learn. And it's really not meant to cause emotional trauma. And there are all kinds of things you can talk about here. It could be sharing current EDI news, introducing a concept or a historical event or practice, just creating some space for personal reflection or practicing change and allyship. And at CSE anyway, everybody gets to do this or can volunteer to do it. And basically what you do is you pick a topic, you put together a PowerPoint slide and just present your moment. No discussion, actually, it's just a chance for reflection. So just a couple of minutes at the beginning of the meeting, you can share your level of familiarity. A lot of people are gonna be really comfortable with presenting topics like this. Other people are gonna be like, I'm still on this journey, I'm still learning. This is what I've learned, and this is what I'd like to present. All right, so Sandy and I are gonna give you four or five different examples of these moments. So I'm gonna start. And again, this is actually presented to me at work last year. This is about the importance of inclusive language. And so this is a table that kind of talks about some very common phrases that we use in our language and why those phrases can be somewhat problematic, right? So a lot of these, I don't really use these phrases too much, but things like uh, fell off a truck or sold down the river, those have origins in systemic racism and classism, right? And there's some other ways in which you can kind of, other phrases you can use instead of these. As a master of ceremonies, I often do things like say, ladies and gentlemen, or um, things like that. And I am very conscious that I use that a lot and I really shouldn't, right? It's really, uh, it's really gendered language, right? So you guys, for example, is something that I use a ton and I have to figure out how to, say something different, right? So and I think actually you'll see in our culture, a lot of people are using folks more or other kinds of non-gender language. And then this part down here is really difficult for me. So, you know, I'm so used to saying, well, that's insane, or that's retarded or lame. Those are really can be hurtful because they, they are, um, it's from kind of ableist language, right? So again, I can look at this table and kind of think carefully about how do I use my language, both in public as well as in personal settings, and how do I need to think about that more carefully when I um, when I talk to you. All right, Sandy, you want to start? Sure. Um, so, thanks. So I I was super excited when I heard about this because um, in terms of I, I love the concepts and stuff, but trying to put stuff into action has always been my my trouble. I, I go to these things and I'm like, okay, how do we do this on my team? And um, when Yoji shared this with me with these moments, I thought, oh my gosh, that's perfect. I can do just a minute or have the kids do. So I created, I can tell you this is, I did two slides. This is the first. And I probably put 10, 15 minutes into it. Um, 
and so it was not hard to do. And basically, I just went out and researched and um, did a did you know that First Inspire offers all kinds of resources, kind of you know going out to what's available online. Um, so you don't need to recreate the wheel in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So just showing your team that you know they can go on to First Inspires and click on these links. It shows uh, really good opportunities of what is out there. And um, yeah, and it would only take you about you know a minute and a half, two minutes. But if you do this each time, I think that it just shows so much of um, supporting the team in terms of. Um, having these conversations and showing that you're open to them. All right, sample number three. Okay. These are the teams that competed for the finals at the 2019 state championship. And what is notable about these teams? Look it out. Like now? It does. All of them? Hmm? All of them? White males? White males? The other thing, though, is actually compared to the 2018 finalists, there are many more girls on these drive teams. You look at this, actually, there are four girls on each of these finalist alliances. So eight out of the 24 students. That's actually pretty representative of the Male female representation in first products. This is really unusual, which is why I like these pictures because if you look again at the previous year, no girls on the team, none whatsoever. But this was a, what's really to me really promising. And the reason this is important to me is because these are the students that I see when I volunteer, and these are the students that the audience sees. Like, not all of them go into the pits and talk to students. When they go, they're sitting in the stands and they're watching these teams compete. And I can tell you, I have anecdotal stories of students who are in there saying, this looks great, but I don't see anybody like me on the field. And I think girls are probably sometimes seeing that too. So these are highly visible positions at a competition. And so, to see so many girls kind of in these positions at this particular big tournament was really meaningful, really important. So, you know, I talk about, I, you know, I've talked a lot with the teams about trying to learn about how do they actually go through the process of selecting students to be on the drive team. It's really interesting. Some schools, some teams have a very defined formal process and others don't. And, um, and so some teams are thinking very carefully about this. Again, this issue of equity, providing fairness and access to opportunity is part of that process, right? So that's another thing. And I can guarantee you there's probably some girl somewhere who's sitting in the stands at this tournament saying, I can do that. I want to do it. And I know I can do it. Right? You have no idea who that person is, but there is probably at least a couple of girls in that audience who thought, I can do that because I see these people. All right. All right. This one was, um, this I actually took from the presentation that Yoji said, so from um, CSE. And one of the things I did point out was making sure that you use references. So um, I adapted that. Um, they talked about using social media and seeing things in social media. Um, I was, I've told a lot of you, we just went to EMCC recently and it's really, it's so fun with these kids because you can tell they're just starting out. And I had a group of kids that were trying to figure out social media. And um, <laughs> I asked one of them to do it and, and she's like, I don't even have Twitter on my phone. And so I'm like, here, take my phone. This is how you do it. Take some pictures. This is what you'll say. I mean, it was kind of a step-by-step, -step, but it was so cool because at the end she was so empowered and she was creating these awesome tweets. But one of the things that I was thinking about afterwards is she didn't use any hashtags. Um, so I'm like, oh, another opportunity for us. But um, some of the, the hashtags to look at and follow, um, if you do a little bit, and maybe some of you are better at social media. I'm not a huge social media person, but um, being able to use some of those Black in STEM, um, First Like a Girl, Diversity in STEM, 
um, to get your tweets out there and then to be able to look at what other people are doing to be able to, um, you know, kind of learn more um, and see, have uh, your teammates see others in action. I think it's really a great opportunity. Um, and then I just put, you know, what does your team lift up on social media? Um, and kind of thinking about this. So, it, you know, it's it's a diversity moment, but it's also a, how are we as a team? It's a culture moment, right? We can change our culture just by having a short conversation, taking, you know, two or three minutes at the beginning of a meeting or whatever. Just, hey, you know, talk once you get other, what do we want to lift up at this upcoming tournament? Cool opportunities. Yes. All right, and the last one I'm going to show you, this is just an example of kind of a personal experience. So, this is actually my very first memory, the oldest memory I have as a human being. I was eight years old watching a TV in my living room when it was happening, you know, I'm strong man. And I can remember that my if mom and dad woke me up, said, you have to watch this. And after that point, I had like plastic models of rackets and lunar explorers in my room. It was just like, it was just such a galvanizing kind of inspirational moment. Right around that time was this image, this other image of space travel. This one. Star Trek was on from 1967 to 1969. I actually didn't know about Star Trek until it went into syndication. But I can tell you, seeing that Japanese American on the screen was huge for me. I had never seen that one. Every representation of an Asian American when I was a kid was a Japanese soldier being killed by John Wayne in a World War II movie or a servant in like a detective. Sulu was the first example of someone I saw that said, actually, I could do this. I could be a scientist. I could be on a spaceship. Because the reality here was presented as only white guys were going to. So that was huge for me. And if you doubt the importance of Star Trek, you know, this is kind of Gene Roddenberry's kind of definition of what the show was about infinite diversity and infinite combinations. When Michelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura, was actually thinking of leaving the show after the first year, and she was told by Martin Luther King Jr. of all people, do not leave the show because that's, this is the only show I want my kids watch because you are on screen the way we want to be seen by other people. And Michelle Nichols went on to actually change the NASA space program. She ended up recruiting for NASA and diversifying their astronaut workforce. So, Faye Jemison, who I think we've heard about through First Robotics, was inspired completely by Michelle Nichols. So, um, so, this is again an example of sort of the rep why representation is really And again, you, you have seen, I think, in outreach events kind of way, young kids kind of look up to your students when they do an outreach event, right? That's, that's the inspiration. And that's exactly what So, um, I think these are really easy kind of things to do, very quick. It just will get your students and your mentors to kind of think about these topics. So I'd encourage you to give it a try and see what you think um, to move forward. Now, finally, let me tell you about some resources that I want you to get. So first in the upper Midwest, let's create this grant program called the FIFO Fund. That's Sandy's invention right there. <laughs> I'm not sure you sold that really well. So first in the upper Midwest. Oh. I, can I? I mean, yeah. I just want to, I really want to encourage everybody to take a look at this. Um, and I know I'm I'm going to speak for um, Toby as, as one of the teams. I, I have a hard time thinking through why I would even do this, you know? Like, it was really funny. I was talking about diversity to my captains, and I'm sitting there as the only white female in the room. 
um because my captains are so diversified i'm like this feels wrong to me um but i it was really good to operationalize as i said and hear about a different team um so this team no mythic actually um got the grant last year and used it to have people come in and talk to their team about their culture and about how to make their culture more inclusive and basically how to welcome other students. And I was like, okay, even my diverse students need to know how to welcome students, right? This is, we all need to know how to be a welcoming environment. Um, so take a look at the application is really pretty easy to do, just a couple of different paragraphs, but you can do it, you know, use it for things like this, having an outside group come in and do a team building exercise with your team. Um, you know, use it, uh, one of our other grants was um, using it to help create flyers to do something at their school. Um, you know, there's there's so many different opportunities to use these grants. And we just really want teams to be able to um, to be able to to incorporate some of this work. It was interesting. I was um, talking to Wendy about the recycling downstairs, and she had said, "I don't know if you guys noticed it. I, I told her there's anxiety when you get all these different trash cans to know where your trash is." But they said that they were able to do that here because of a grant that they got. They gave them money to do it. So I want everybody to know and like tell your friends and tell other teams that there's money here to be able to do some of these things. And so um, I know it seems overwhelming, but it's it's something that is so valuable. And I think your your team will get so much out of it. So, and if anything else, they get to write a grant and that's really helpful too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so the application deadline like September 1st. Yeah, Alex. Um. <laughs> <clears throat> How do we get out of the starting gate without tripping on our own shoes? I'm a very basic white male. My culture on our team and in our school is about 98.5% white male. On the team, it's different, but we do have some of our diverse students in the school on our team. And what I'm afraid of is tokenization of that group if we go about doing some of this stuff. Yeah. This is that I, I know that I'm not alone. I think there's gonna be a lot of teams that are gonna be like, I don't why would I even apply for this when I'm not sure how I go about doing this like Sandy just said I'm white female in the room with a bunch of different other people. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, and so, yeah. So think think about think about kind of in your SWAT analysis. Right, for example, if there's a place in your SWOT analysis where you're identifying a weakness or a threat that has some aspect of representation associated with it, and it doesn't have to be racial and ethnic representation, it can be gender, it can be um, IEP, you know, IEP status, for example, for the students, or can I give an example of that? Status. Yeah, absolutely, please. When I took over this, my team um, four years ago, maybe it was three, there was this. Under unspoken rule of the team that if you showed up with less than a C in any class, that you would be escorted out of the room and sent home or somewhere else to deal with that. Do not show up to practice if you have less than a C average, which of course exempted the ability of many of the special education students because they just, many of them who were interested, did not perform at the C level ever. Since I have taken over the team, I happen to be a special education teacher. We've incorporated a model that if you are below a C, you might not be working on the robot, but there's a team member there to help you to bring that average back up. So we still have a high expectation for academic performance, but now we address it differently. My team's special ed population is probably closer to 35% in a district that identifies special ed at about 12 to 13. Mm -hmm. So we are now creating a space for those students who are not involved in anything else because they can't be, because by the time they hit midterm and they're failing a class, now they can't participate in whatever other sport they may want to do. Now they've got a place for that. Now it wasn't purposeful, it just happened. And sometimes those things, Alex, because I'm in the same boat as you, I don't want to tokenize because I happen to have three students of color in my entire building. <laughs> and now, right, I've got one in my on my team. That is not what we're after. We're after creating an environment that allows people to feel like they want to be there. 
and have the ability to be successful there. I would, I, I, I don't know. I, I, that one of my questions would be, is it really, I mean, is it a token thing? I mean, maybe talking to those people that are representative would help in some ways. Maybe they can get on board and say, hey, yeah, but, um, it's interesting. I, I just was talking with, um, I've been doing a lot of this recently, but I've got, I went to a family reunion and um, I was talking to my cousin who is a lesbian and we were, were talking about all these things. And she took, came to me afterwards and she goes, you know, the best way to be an ally is to just say your pronouns. And that just shows people that you are open. So my thought is that even having the conversation maybe is a way to start, you know? Um, how do we, how are we open on our team? And is this something that we value? I mean, just having those beginning conversations um, is probably gonna show people, like, I don't think that they would be tokenized, hopefully. They don't feel like that. If it's coming from a place that we wanna do better, you know, we want more people included. Um, one of the best ways to get started with a grant like this, this is, we're not looking for some big bombastic idea. Have a student write your application. They know, they know what, what they want on their team. And this is a fabulous conversation because it, it teaches them that, oh, a grant is not a big, scary thing. It's not a big, scary con construct. So they're, you know, to your point, Alex, it's a conversation with the kids and let them do it. Let them let them lead the way. They're gonna they're gonna know what they want right now. The Adina team has had any number of students who are um, on the on the autism scale, um, kids who have IEPs, kids who have taken leaves of absences to you know take care of significant things in their lives, but we've managed to keep them on the team because we're like, okay, you know, our response to all of it is, well, okay, sure. And we, we've, we've just been able to um, keep people with us by keeping them with us, you know, kind of meeting them where they are and, and keeping them involved to the best extent that, that we can. But there may well be something, you know, within that, that your kids on your team might say, you know, we really do want to keep our, you know, kids who are performing perhaps as highly in school as they can. There's a lot of opportunity. A grant of a couple of hundred dollars can get you an after school tutor for an hour who says, anyone who needs writing help, we have this person. That's that's the kind of thinking that's going. This is a seed. And every team has has that capability to to have a seed. I'm really impressed by one of the uh, teams that that applied last time. They wanted seed funding to increase their LGBTQIA offerings. And they built out a website and I believe there's some in-school component to it now. Yeah, they built the, so that's the errors. They yep. built a, they have a website component, but they built a, a resource center in the library and they used that money to basically build out that resource center. Mm -hmm. That grant was written by a student that was a student. I don't. I don't take any kind of mentor involvement other than kind of looking at it and saying this looks good. But if the contact was a student, written by a student, really student driven, and uh, if you look at their website, they've got a really nice website. And there's probably a, a, a resource in play. So, um, yeah, as Sandy mentioned, no mythic. They basically use the money to basically ask a consultant to come in, basically work with them, do some training. They really wanted to kind of do this culture analysis. They wanted to really figure out kind of what is our team like um, and figure out what the team culture is and what they needed to work on before they went ahead with their efforts to kind of recruit students from different populations. Right. So, and that I think that's also kind of working well. And then this team in North Dakota, they just wanted some resources to do more outreach. They just wanted to figure out how can we reach more kids in their schools. Right? So, again, you know, it's a thousand dollars to encourage you to kind of think about it. You can introduce the ball, but there's no resources to do with you. The other ones I want to just quickly mention is, you know, um, 
Well, Sandy and I are on the diversity and inclusion committee, which basically puts together this new grant program. We're always looking for new committee members if you're interested in this topic and this, um, moving this forward. We'd encourage you to kind of uh, get involved, and it's a very, very short application process. It's both students and mentors. So we've had a couple of students on the committee. They've been fantastic. And uh, so it's, it's available to students as well as mentors. Talk about the first resources. Other FRC teams are obviously places you can turn to. And uh, their school, of course, is another place. I know students are receiving this kind of, um, it's kind of, I don't know if you call it training, but I, I think that there's lots of discussions going on about these topics within schools and with students. And then there's support organizations like LGBTQ plus first and first ladies, other ones that you can also And then finally, I'm going to end with sort of this going back to culture, which is kind of what we kind of started with. And I just, uh, Alex kind of mentioned this earlier. Um, I've had the opportunity, and I will say it's really kind of honor and privilege to work with a lot of different teams and helping them sort of facilitate uh, activities to focus on identifying with their core values. And um, we've been doing this, I think, since 2017, I think it is. So if you go to the Minnesota First Cover Midwest website, or some information about these core values workshops. You can do it on your own. I'm happy to kind of give you those resources. If you want me or some members of 1816 to come join you with a facilitated session, I'm happy to do that as well. It takes about an hour and a half to two hours to do it. And then there's a lot of additional work that happens after the workshop. So this workshop will basically help your team kind of figure out what are your team's core values. And then there's a lot of subsequent work that will be done by the team to kind of operationalize that, to further define those values, and figure out how to make them work. So, um, these are examples of pictures that we've done of these workshops. I put this one here because we also can do it virtually and like that's also possible. Um, and these. Minnesota and outside Minnesota that we have issues. So we work with a lot of them. Um, and we travel. So if you, if you want something done in person, we're happy to do that. We've gone as far away as Illinois to do it. Um, on some virtual things, so there's like in Pennsylvania. Um, but we're happy to we're happy. So I think from our perspective, in terms of the first team that we did this with, which was 1816, it was really it has been a very important component of establishing what our team's all about, the culture that we have, and trying to make sure that we kind of are consistent with our, with our core values. So that's another research that's good. Here's my contact information. I'm happy to kind of answer any information for you. And then I think there's a little bit of questions and discussion. Uh, how are we doing for time? Okay. Yep, we're just kind of seeing towards the end, which is open discussion anyway. Me and Alex were with a uh, call with Medtronics about jumpstart events, and we spent the majority of our time talking about this because Medtronic is looking for on their quote, uh, their grants, like you mentioned, OG. But what they want is see what. You guys are going to put in place. So you're taking steps to open.